Hello. Thank you. We are 10 minutes late, so we'll try and catch up. My name is Murali Shanmugavelan, and I'm with SOAS. Um, I'm a PhD student, but I'm also attached to Billet Services Trust. So I'm going to do a very quick PR plugin. There's a, a small brochure here. So you can just have a look at it and read what the organization does. And if you need more information, Tony Huckle. Can you please raise your hand, Tony? Tony is here. You can speak to him. So that's just about BSD, one of the organizers of the event. Thank you. Um, as you know, this session is on cost meets gender. And I've deliberately decided not to read bios of the speakers, because you have one with you. <clears throat> So I did ask the speakers how I'd like to introduce them. Um, oh, by the way, there's um, an interesting anecdote. Uh, that, poster, that, that poster is really good. And it, um, I think Asha Kovtal can speak more about it, uh, because she's in that picture. She's the woman. <laughs> so that explains uh, who my first speaker is. And um, when I asked her, um, how, how, how well should I introduce you, Hasha, she said, Dalit women, we are not flowers, we are flames of resistance. Asha, please. Good morning and Jai Bheem to you all. I greet you in the name of uh, Dr. Ambedkar because I think that <clears throat> without him and his contribution to our lives, uh, I wouldn't be here and I don't think we would be organizing this very large uh, conference. Uh, first of all, I would really like to appreciate uh, SOAS and all the other co-organizers for organizing this uh, cast uh, out of the shadows uh, conference. I believe this is a very relevant time in history that this conference is being organized, particularly here in the UK. Uh, as you all know that uh, <clears throat> our Prime Minister, uh, uh, Mr. Narendra Modi, has been on his world tour and with his um, rock show kind of uh, <clears throat> presentations in the stadiums all across the world. And I think coming very soon to uh, your country as well, and I think uh, very important, uh, I say that because we are here uh, on a session to discuss caste meeting uh, gender. I think I must uh, really thank the organizers for uh, making this session one of the core sessions of this conference. As many of you would agree with me that uh, in the presentations done earlier this morning, a lot of data was presented, a lot of qual quantitative analysis, which very much lacked the uh, data, uh, disaggregated data on caste and, and gender, like where do Dalit women actually uh, figure out within this whole uh, statistical analysis is a huge uh, question for us today. Also, uh, I would also want to add that when we are looking at all of this data, <clears throat> my struggle um, as an activist, as a whatever practitioner, has been really to look at the politics behind this data that is being churned out and, you know, the authenticity itself uh, of this data, that is a huge uh, challenge that we are facing as uh, Dalit women uh, in India. Also, my sincere appreciation to all of you who have come here for this conference. To me, this, uh, this actually signifies that all of you have had that interest to know more, uh, to understand, probably to even challenge our own mindsets, and maybe in some way, uh, contribute to this uh, movement to end, uh, you know, caste and uh, patriarchy and find our um, unique ways of making some uh, contribution. So, re so really, thank you all <clears throat> for that. Um, intersectionality. Uh, intersectionality, I don't think, is a very uh, new term or a new concept. A lot has been said, a lot has been uh, written, a lot has been uh, studied about it. In fact, Dalit women activists for a long time have been talking about this violent nexus of caste and gender, uh, patriarchy and this whole uh, caste hegemony and what it means 
to our lives, social, economic, political, culturally, um, and otherwise. We have organized ourselves uh, to face this kind of structural violence and discrimination uh, at various levels. Words like multiple forms of discrimi discrimination, uh, layers of oppression, caste, class, gender, uh, you know, gendered analysis within the structure of uh, poverty. Uh, so many words and terminologies have been used. In fact, now I feel this whole victimization uh, analysis within this intersectionality framework sometimes very often gets loosely used also without really getting at the core of what it means to be born as a Dalit, as a Dalit woman in extremely poor uh, conditions of uh, family and community. Um, I think a very quick cross-section uh, when we look at the perpetrators of these uh, crimes or this violence against Dalit women will give us a very clear picture. Now, who are these uh, perpetrators? Very often, uh, dominant caste men, uh, groups of men, mixed caste, sometimes includes even men from our own communities. Perpetrators also include women from the dominant caste who are in hand in hand with these crimes that are being perpetrated on, uh, on us, that, uh, on us uh, Dalit women. So when we look at this cross-section of perpetrators, really then we can understand what is this intersectionality and in this whole web of uh, violence and untouchability and discrimination, who is playing what kind of role and where are the Dalit women actually placed in this intersectionality lens. The spectrum of violence, I need not say, I think many of us in this room have read uh, a lot of um, cases, um, have been on the field, have seen different research data, uh, and heinous crimes, even as I stand and speak before you, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of um, uh, struggle when we look at the kind of violence that is inflicted on our girls and uh, on our women. But the point that I want to make in this whole uh, analysis of violence against Dalit women is actually the targeted kind of violence which we're actually subject to, particularly because the assertion, where there is greater assertion, there there is much more uh, backlash or violence that is actually silencing um, our voices. Very often, the assertion is for economic rights. Very often, the assertion is for access to land, access to resources, access to governance, and access to actually spaces of uh, decision making. And I think that is a trend that we are actually seeing uh, uh, so much more. It's not a new thing. Uh, I think Professor Thorat had very clearly given the whole history of how caste came into being and it's all its ramifications in different uh, spheres. But uh, over the time, sufficient uh, analysis is being done. A lot of research is being uh, there. Right now we're at a stage where there is really no dearth of evidence to say that the violence, discrimination, and untouchability faced by Dalit women is very different from uh, the uh, women who are definitely not uh, a homogeneous uh, group. I think the relevant discussion for us this morning is to really look at the changing contours of impunity. Impunity at every level, right from, you know, the site of violence up to the uh, state of, con uh, into, until the stage of uh, conviction and what goes wrong at every uh, step. That's why I said, like even the National Crime Records Bureau, which actually uh, puts the figure at four Dalit women being raped every day, I just cannot accept that data because just in a period of 45 days in two or three districts of a small state like Haryana, we ourselves, a group of five or six uh, activists, recorded more than 45 cases of sexual violence. Just last week, we got all the uh, data from the different states that we're working, sitting with over 100 cases of sexual violence, which we as a small team have recorded. The point I'm trying to make is that the National Crime Records Bureau only records the cases that actually reach the police station. And if at all those sections were put under this particular act of the uh, uh, SEST Prevention of Atrocities Act, 
very often it is like okay when there's a crime against uh, anybody the first stop of justice is the police station for us friends actually it is cross crossing that upper caste uh, or the dominant caste neighborhood to actually reach that police station that's where most of our cases are either compromised force forcefully with threat intimidation and with lot of uh, money that exchange um, hands at that at that moment uh, that's why i'm saying the changing contours of impunity the nexus between the doctors the, the medical officers the investigation officers the political parties and everybody involved in that crime it is so dirty and really so poisonous today in a country that is really obsessed with growth uh, obsessed with economic development uh, and i would say very much a right wing uh, 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 capitalist kind of a model that is being uh, you know uh, uh, piloted in my country the question that we are asking is at whose cost is all this happening and really the brazenness of impunity that we have actually experienced in the last year or last year and a half impunity has always been there i do not like say that when the previous government was there everything was fine for us dalit women no but i would like to i would really like to say that the the brazenness of the crimes and the way in which perpetrators are getting away scot free is really uh, something else i think with this whole you know very much um, hetero patriarchal hindu identity which is being thrown at our faces every day that you know if you are if you are your national nationality of being an indian and your identity of being a hindu and so then you can live in this country and then probably access justice or not that is something that is being thrown at us every single um, a day and actually that leaves really very less space for alternative politics leave alone articulations voices and discourse of uh, dalit women who are really at the bottom bottom of this whole um, uh, hegemony or you know this whole caste order um i would like to actually uh, take a pause right now and show you one uh, small video clip of i think two and a half minutes uh, and then i'll just continue to say what i have to say there comes a point when you can't take one more headline when you are sick of the violence and you are tired of being afraid uske baad jab hum wo janwar ki zindagi bhi jee rahe hain uske baad bhi phir hame janwaron ki tarah use bhi karte hain log गरीब हूं मेरे पीछे सपोर्ट करने वाला नहीं है कोई ये फिर गाली गलोच करने लग गया फिर जब एकदम मैंने मैंने कहा पीछे कर अपनी पिस्तौल मैंने कहा क्या मार ही देंगे लेकिन जब उसके बाद ने एकदम उसने ना ऐसे करके घुमाई उसके अंदर मैडम बिल्कुल गोलियां Dalit women's bodies are used as a battleground for the caste war. The attacks on our bodies that are used to teach a lesson to the larger community. In 2014 courageous band of women came together to take on the caste system and to say enough is enough yeh the peace yeh the justice wo naat na kalavar nadakala wo naat na rayat nadakala ratham ratham sindala upay kodu sapal kekala the naat justice really the question is why 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 is it that a group of 15 20 uh, young um, you know dalit 
youth, uh, women from the community have to take out, plan something like the Dalit Women Self-Respect March, travel from one district to another district, go and meet with the survivors, organize the community, come and then fight with the police, fight with the district collectors, actually get thrown out of their offices, actually further, further uh, victimization. If everything was well and if everything was okay, why should we be doing something like this uh, at, at a great uh, risk? Why is it that today, like whatever few Dalit women we are, we have to come to the Human Rights Council every year to plead with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, international human rights mechanisms to recognize caste and particularly caste-based violence on women as a global human rights concern. Why do we run to CEDAW? Why do we run to the Commission uh, Status of Women? Every, every instrument from the local to the global level we have been uh, trying to use, yet there is this extreme uh, form of uh, silencing uh, our voices. Always there is a silence when this bad word of caste is being talked, uh, talked and every declaration that we worked with, every mechanism that we worked with, find every ways to actually delete that five letter word from, from the entire human rights discourse. So really uh, the question is when we as a small group of Dalit women have to uh, challenge and fight against this mighty Indian state uh, where does that leave us uh, as, uh, as Dalit women who are actually formulating our own articulations and our own uh, discourse? Today in India, there is no dearth of uh, policies. There is no dearth of legislations. You name it and you get it. Uh, whether you uh, like say education, then you will get a right to education. You say employment, you'll get a uh, right to employment. You say access to uh, justice, there will be uh, something for that. But really, uh, it's almost like handed to you in a silver plate. But the real question is, what do we do with all of these? The uh, Prime Minister Modi announced uh, Beti Padao, Beti Bachao. Ba basically, it means educate your girl child and, you know, make her to grow into somebody. The question we are again and again asking is whose, whose girl child you want to save, whose girl child you want to educate when you are just ignoring this whole structural uh, hegemony of caste. We cannot, you cannot separate these two. We'll be just fooling um, ourselves. So actually the question for us Dalit women that we are raising today is intersectionality of these laws, intersectionality of the, of the schemes. Now you all must have heard about Nirbhaya, the unfortunate incident where this girl was uh, uh, raped and murdered in the, in the moving bus in Delhi, after which a lot of agitations took place. Amendments to the criminal laws were made. There are other legislations called as POXO, which looks at Child Sexual Offences Act. There's also the SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act, more than 25 years old. But in all of these intersections of all of these laws, where do we as Dalit women form? That is not there in the lens of the policy makers. Already mention was made about the special component plan and tribal sub plan, which actually allocates a percentage of money for development schemes for our communities. Does those laws actually have anything specific for us, uh, any targeted schemes for us Dalit women that is also absent in the eyes of, uh, of the uh, policy makers today? So whether we fit in or we don't fit in or actually are we being forcefully fit into some existing policies and legislations is really what the Dalit women are asking to the policy makers and also to uh, members of civil society. We have a very revolutionary uh, constitution in place. We have truckloads of legislations, policies, development schemes uh, in our country. But sometimes like we as Dalit women, we are asking, should we keep going back again and again to these institutions, mandated to give us justice, but actually denying it to us at every uh, step? What is it that when there is a system, where are these institutions with such deep seated institutional mindsets which are so biased on caste and patriarchy, including the judiciary, including the legislature, including the media, including civil society, why are we going back to these same institutions which are not delivering anything for us or will they ever deliver anything for us? Is it time that as Dalit women we create our own institutions? Do we need to have our own spaces to create our own, our own history and our own voices of articulation? 
is something, then how do we fight this kind of a very uh, strong uh, hege hegemonical power? I don't know whether we reject them uh, at this point because caste is everywhere very much within the uh, judiciary itself. Uh, lastly, I want to quickly come to uh, looking at what kind of challenges we are facing. Already a lot has been said about the changing political landscape in the country. A lot of changes are being made into the policies, uh, shrinking spaces for civil society organizations, particularly Asha. activists, uh, activist organizations, where we are facing a lot of uh, digital security issues as well as physical security issues. And also at a time that Dalit women are actually challenging this whole appropriation of our own history, of our own voices by other groups. A time has come that we are building our own narratives from our own history and where is that uh, space uh, for that? So as we're moving forward, friends, what the Dalit women's movement is asking is not merely for funding or not merely for financial resources, but we're actually really seeking genuine allyship and solidarity, which means we all have to under undertake that very difficult task of unpacking our own privilege and how will we stand by in, in allyship or in solidarity in enabling us as Dalit women to build our own narratives, create, rewrite our own histories and take forward uh, this movement for justice. Because I think without uh, escalating this into a very large global campaign, we will not be able to end impunity and India will continuously get away scot-free. But I really think everyone in this room, now that we know we cannot like not do something and I think it's a call, really call for action for all of us to be involved in this movement. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Harsha. Um, and next comes Dr. Jayashree Mangubai, and this is what she had to say. When I started my PhD in southern Tamil Nadu villages among Dalit women, the first thing women would tell me is, what can I tell you? We are only illit illiterate and low caste women. And then they started to share how they had successfully struggled against all, all odds for four years to obtain housing land for over 50 families and how they had overcome <coughs> discrimination, threats, and even violence. That to me, Dalit women's power and potential. Dr. Jeshri Mangubai. Okay, thank you. Just to pick up from Asha's um, powerful um, talk, I, you might be wondering, well, what is the Indian government doing about it? How does it look and treat Dalit women? Um, as you've heard in the morning, we have, we have the privilege of having a rights-based constitution in India that prohibits and um, discrimination based on caste and gender. We have affirmative action provisions. We also have in local governance, we actually have a specific quota for scheduled caste women, in addition to quotas for scheduled caste as well as quotas for women. We also have from the 11th plan onwards, there's been actually a focus on what the government says, inclusive growth. And within that, there's actually been specific mention, so that for the last 10 years of talking about Dalit women as a specific vulnerable and marginalized category of women, calling for the implementation of protective laws for them, and also distinct provisions for Dalit women in program planning, financial allocations, and distribution of reservations in education and employment. And that's actually there in the plan. That was there for the 11th plan. The 12th plan has similar provisions, at least on looking at Dalit women. And yet, you've listened to what Asha has been saying about the reality. And one of the things that I want to look at is on one hand, you have gaps in terms of the implementation of these laws, these policies for programs. So you actually have violence, uh, uh, violations of the rights of Dalit women are trivialized often. They're often questioned as whether they're genuine or not. So if, if when a lot of rape cases take place, there have been a number of counter discourses that I've heard from judges down to police officials saying, yeah, but you know what, a lot of them just make up these cases. So you have those kind of discourses, you have the under in, um, enforcement of laws and policies and schemes. And if you look at it across the board, what you're seeing is that it operates to institutionalize a hierarchy of social groups on the basis of the extent to which groups, which caste groups, 
enjoy informal rights and entitlements in reality. And always across the board, you see that Dalit women enjoy, enjoy the least rights and entitlements. And on the other hand, what Asha touched upon is that in the very design of government measures, you see that in, in India we have a plethora of measures for Dalits, scheduled castes, or for women. But what the government often is unable to do is to recognize how do you look at both of these identities together and the ways that they intersect. So you often see that Dalit women fall within the gaps. So there are a number of issues where you see that, say, in terms of budgets, as Asha mentioned, where are the programs for Dalit women? The same in terms of benefits that, the, that at least a few benefits that are supposed to derive to schedule caste, and there are huge issues in the delivery of those benefits. But even those often end up in the hands of men rather than women. So whether it be land title for men or alternative livelihood provisions, often don't reach Dalit women. So even if you look at quotas and the way that quotas work, on the one hand, you have this strong pushback at the moment, and it's been going for a long time, against reserved quotas. So all on the basis of merit, which ignores the fact that merit has also been something that's historically constructed on the basis of unequal access to resources, to social capital, to knowledge on the basis of caste. And on the other hand, when you look at the way that work and employment quotas sometimes work in practice is that often Dalit women are told, well, you're a woman, you can't apply for their scheduled caste quota. And then the flip side is then they say, well, no, you're a Dalit, you can't apply for the women's quota. And then on top of that, you get this idea that quotas is a form of rationing. So the idea is that then you're not allowed to access the general quotas based on merit, which to me is to me an absolute counter of the whole merit versus um, reservations debate. And all of that is then compounded by the fact that if you look at the data, we still have for this small, tiny por portion of reserved seats, um, you have a lot of unfilled seats. You also have a lack of emphasis then on, on giving Dalit women the quality education that is required for them to access reservations. Um, on the other hand, you've got, so what I'm looking at is then a lot of the very little space that really exists in reality for Dalit women to claim resources through existing institutions and the types of glass ceilings on the choices and opportunities that de facto operate despite the fact that we have equal opportunity laws, we have a plethora of, of schemes and programs in place. And yet issues of gender dis um, difference are often, in, when looking at them interlinked with caste, are often ignored in terms of explanations of social change, for example, occurring in the market economy today. So we've, we've heard about discussions in the morning, but for me what's quite interesting is that at least there's a little bit of anecdotal evidence and they're not solid in terms of the fact that how as, say, for example, agriculture we're talking about gets increasingly mechanized, as Dalit men in some way or the other have, there's been a little bit, it's not, I wouldn't call it social mobility, but at least a moving out of traditional occupations like agricultural labor to find, if not it's small, non-farm labor occupations in cities. But then what you see is that Dalit women uh, assume de facto responsibility for continuing caste occupations. So you look at them in terms of agriculture today. There are a huge population, I mean, percentage of the agricultural workforce. Again, you look at cleaning, you look at a number of sectors that have been traditionally allocated for Dalits on the basis of their caste. You see that women are the ones that are performing those occupations together. You also have um, evidence very clearly that's emerging that how non-Dalit women are moving into higher level occupations than Dalit women. So, sorry, how more dominant caste women are moving into higher level occupations than Dalit women. And those disparities are increasingly um, widening. So what to me it signals very clearly is a lack of investment to build the knowledge and skills of Dalit women to be able to compete with other caste women when it comes to accessing market resources. Um, at the same time, you might be asking, well, then what are development actors and social movements doing to respond? Um, and it has been very patchy. There's been fairly limited recognition or understanding of the different needs and situation of Dalit women, though I think that is certainly changing because of people like Asha, Dalit women's activists who have become more and more vocal explaining what is their situation, the changes that are happening. And you also see very much, and this is something that 
constantly have uh, issues in India is the silence of the women's movement and even development actors that focus on gender equality because there's a lot of gender projects that happen in India on the needs, for example, to address caste-based discrimination against Dalit women. So there's often this thing of, well, we should be talking about domestic violence against the Dalit women and what Dalit men to do to Dalit women without recognizing that all of us in, our, in, in Indian society, we are both gendered and caste constructed. And the, our positions, the way that we react, does, means that you have to understand that as a continuum of violence from domestic violence all the way to caste violence, the atrocities that Ramesh and Asha shared. So one has been this, uh, this failure or this non-willingness to look beyond what's happening in the community, recognize that external caste relations also impact on, on community dynamics. And also to understand that the strategies that Dalit women may have may be very different when you have to deal with a hostile caste context. So how do you reconcile that and, and continue to protect and preserve these rights of these women and the priorities they set for themselves? So that has been one aspect. The other, the other one to me would be, and Ashif, I will share in the um, afternoon, is the failure to take up manual scavenging, a lot of work that actually gets done by a disproportionate number of Dalits and disproportionate of Dalit women. And yet, is this seen as a gender equality or a gender justice issue? No, nor have mainstream development actors understood how dominant castes have gained power in the market economy while maintaining these kinds of caste and gender boundaries that then deny Dalit women access to equal access to productive resources. And on the other hand, you've seen a lot of Dalit women also uh, challenging the exclusions from the Dalit movements. They often failure to acknowledge the interests, the leadership of, of Dalit women. And that, I think, has been in some ways a bit more successful in terms of widening the spaces within the Dalit movements today, also widening the Dalit rights discourse, which in the last 20 years has become stronger and stronger, but is often given primarily to caste violence and other issues, but not really looked at patriarchy and caste and how they intersect. So I think there are lots of opportunities, and those opportunities to me today are coming from grassroots Dalit women activists, villagers who are increasingly mobilizing to often reinterpret, to reimagine, to change Dalit rights activism so as to address their gender-specific priorities. So I'm talking about women that are looking at access to land title, access to housing for their families, access to alternative jobs, um, looking at fights against the destructive development practices like shrimp farming, for example, I've looked at in, uh, happening in coastal areas of Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. And you also have women that have themselves faced violence. I remember a few years ago I met a woman, who, um, Mohini Devi from Bihar, and she herself was a victim of sexual assault. Of, of, she had been raped. She had fought unsuccessfully through a, a, a biased system to try and get justice. But then she transformed that into, with the support of local activists, she transformed that to say, turn around to her own community and say, just put up your hand, any one of you who has not been raped in this village in the last 10 years by a dominant caste man. And not one of those women could put up their hand. And from that, she has started to organize women in her village to, to look at protection issues, to start to raise more and more voice when there is harassment of young Dalit women. So I think that those are, to me, are the, the inspiring voices. Those are the voices that we need to capitalize, to build upon. And one of the arguments that these women are using is because Dalit women have traditionally played a greater economic role in their households than other women. So they are putting forward that they have a right to almost priority as well in the way that we address issues of caste discrimination and violence um, in the country. And what's interesting to me about all of these struggles and, and things I think that we need to look at is the fact that all of these struggles allow, um, well, require Dalit women to negotiate complex power relations at multiple levels. So that at the level of their family, sometimes at the level of their community, the wider dominant caste society, as well as the state, in order to access resources for their development and security. And only by understanding those kinds of distinct experiences that they face of subordination exclusion, can you understand how Dalit activism often becomes gendered? So my own research that I've done, I was actually looking at just 
grassroots level movements of, of, of Dalit women. And it was to me very interesting to see that even the political spaces in which these women maneuvered are very different from what Dalit men maneuver because of the fact that because of their intersection of their caste and gender identity, not only are they more socially isolated, but they're also more marginalized from the formal arena of politics. So in terms of being separated from, say, dominant caste male politics, from the local governance politics that happens around them, they are quite isolated. And it actually enables them sometimes to more effectively pursue claims for land, for resources, through means that, that avoid confrontation and conflict. Dimension. And the way, one minute? Okay, right. So the, this, uh, to me, these different spaces actually signal the need for development strategies that build on Dalit women's multiple identities and the kinds of spaces they create. And also to recognize that if you only build a strategy or an intervention around one identity, you can often disempower these women on the basis of another identity. Um, and I've got examples, but I'm not going to share them, but a lot of the partners that we are working with are doing fantastic work out there. They are young Dalit women leaders who are emerging, who are taking up, building thousands of collectives of Dalit women across their own states to take up cases of violence, to build women's knowledge and capacity and recognize that knowledge and capacity to act give power to, to the women. There are also um, a colleague in Gujarat, for example, who's mobilizing Dalit women's leadership in the villages, but then in this, by mobilizing their leadership in the villages in the panchat, she's actually been able, they've actually been able to spearhead a campaign on violence against women that cuts across caste and communal lines. So by, but with the very idea that you keep Dalit women's leadership at the center in order to get others to acknowledge or to, to, to gain recognition and respect for these women and their qualities. So I will perhaps leave it at there, but my last two things, if I may, would be, if Very I look quickly. at- Very quickly, huh? Very quickly. Yeah, yeah, no, it's gonna be four words. Where, okay, if I was to look at interventions, where do I think key interventions are required, I would say in terms of livelihoods, knowledge and skills, in terms of production, and I mean not only in production in terms of economic production, but also in terms of production of knowledge, because as most of you know that Dalits, and particularly Dalit women under the caste system, have traditionally been denied knowledge, and knowledge is power. So to me it's about that, and it's also about making them asset owners, which means that you have to confront both um, caste as well as gender and the way that it plays out in terms of denying property or assets to women, if I can end on one quote, because it is the 125th anniversary of Dr. Ambedkar, I just want to end with one quote, which you said, I'm conscious of the fact that if women are conscientized, the untouchable community will progress. I believe women should organize, and this will play a major part in bringing an end to social evils. The progress of the Dalit community should be measured in terms of the progress made by its women. Thank you. Thanks to both speakers. And we just have about 12 to 13 minutes. So may I request you to stick to questions? You're more than welcome to share your comments with speakers during lunchtime. So just questions, please, and go straight to your questions. So what, can we take like three questions? One, two. Yeah, one, two, three. Okay, good. Please introduce yourself. Hi, um, my name is Kieran McGuire from the Carona Trust. It's a question for Asha. Um, you spoke about attacks on women's bodies as a, a way of uh, perpetrators teaching a community a lesson. And I was just very interested that you mentioned three varieties. You, you talked about um, dominant caste men, which I, I assume most of us will understand the relationship um, between dominant caste men and women from a, um, a so-called lower caste background. But mixed caste men and women from other castes joining in seems like a very, um, just a very interesting area. And I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about those categories. Um, just back. Thank you. My name is Aditi Thorat, and this is a question for Asha. 
Asha, you talked about rejecting or considering rejecting the dominant structures of hegemony and creating and developing your own institutions and own spaces for, for politics. What would this look like? What does this mean? It would be great if you could unpack this a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shrikant Borkar from University of Sussex. Uh, on the line of uh, the, uh, the last speaker's uh, um, suggestion to uh, devise strategies of empowerment and development of women, and also on the line of what <coughs> Asha has said, that uh, uh, the Dalit women have to, sorry to use this word, I don't really uh, subscribe this word, and I don't really like this word, so what the untouchables, first while untouchable women, they have to they have to form their own institutions on the line. I would like to uh, request and I would like to ask the budding uh, expert on social uh, South Asian society as well as the senior experts, senior scholars, that uh, what is the what are the possibilities of uh, forming, uh, forging uh, ways on the lines of uh, um, the militant uh, anthropology and the applied anthropology. Uh, to, to form such uh, interfaces between the activist and academia, so as to um, include not only from the uh, academics from the perpetrator ca caste, but also uh, the representatives of the victim <coughs> caste. Uh, and then they could be added uh, to, 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 to find a solution on this uh, ongoing plight in the context of this rape campaign which is going on in India, especially when it comes to <coughs> women <coughs> as a weapon to discipline the uh, a political assertion of the Dalit uh, uh, law class. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yep, okay. It's the last question for the first round and then... Well, this is to both, this is not a question but uh, information and if you can comment because you, both of you, you haven't touched on that. The, the problem of religious prostitution, which is on a large scale in Karnataka and bordering Maharashtra, what is called Devdasi, uh, it's a very, very serious problem. Uh, and it comes through religious traditions and customs. Yes. Yep. Um, <clears throat> to, to answer the first question, uh, when I said that um, uh, very often caste violence is used to silence the assertions and actually to reinforce uh, the caste hegemony, uh, there are so many cases which speak true to this fact, whether you look at Kailanji, whether you look at Chunduru or Lakshmanpur Bhate and, and the cases which were already uh, shared in the earlier presentation, all of those signify that wherever the, uh, we were asking for greater wages or we moved forward in terms of getting some gainful employment or maybe getting an access to, you know, maybe a govern governance at the village council level. Backlash violence was used to silence uh, on women, violence against women was used to silence our men and our whole community. In that process and some of the cases that we have worked, we have seen the perpetrators being um, predominantly uh, dominant caste men. Many times we have seen that uh, uh, men from our own community were used again as a, what do you call it? Uh, what is the word? Uh, but like used as a stooge, is that, a, I don't know. Like actually used to perpetrate that violence and also used to get away, Scott, uh, you know, get away, get, get, get away from the, uh, from the crime. Um, so, and again, because again, many times we have seen like, for example, where cases of violence against women were reported, very quickly the system will work in a way where they bring the investigation of it, officer who is also a Dalit and then make him to not file our case or make him to not, uh, you know, uh, push this case investigation in the right way. So it's again how this larger system is actually using people and particularly our men to actually evade uh, uh, justice from us. Um, many cases we have seen uh, where women also were involved in mass 
mass violence uh, where they actually took part in preparation for a uh, uh, for an attack on the community or also many times where they actually stood in defense of their boys or their men who actually committed uh, the crimes so uh, to protect their own sons or their own men from their own families so these i just i said that based on the experience of cases that we've actually been uh, dealing with uh, the second question about you know whether we just just reject this whole uh, crazy system which is not giving us anything or what should we do uh, to be very honest we don't know what that will look like but this is a question that many of us within the collective have been continuously struggling with because every time we go to the uh, you know police officer who is like not willing to even register our cases these officers they actually something like this goes on in their mind that oh you are a low, so called lower caste and so for the lack of better word you are a low character and so you are meant to be used anyway so why have you come here for compensation or why have you come here so in that way they 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 that's that's the kind of feeling that we get every time we uh, encounter with the system so we've been starting to think like should we have our own uh, media where we record our own stories should we build our own skills where we have our own institutions of uh, building our own knowledge writing our own history many of these uh, survivor support programs we don't have anything exclusive for us should we have our own shelters where we have a, a, you know counseling and care for us so we've been thinking we really been thinking and we don't know how it's going to look like but that is an emerging thought within the collective and yes what uh, uh, thorat sir has said about whole devdasi and religious prostitution again it stems from this fact that you know anyway your body was meant for my use so you might as well like you know be dedicated to some goddess and then actually end up being a prostitute or that is actually taking new forms now because uh, those pockets where uh, religious prostitution was uh, going on those are actually the sites where women are being trafficked and it's actually moving from the old religious prostitution to actually uh, trafficking and all the many villages in those pockets of north karnataka and parts of andhra pradesh are actually empty and uh, the girls are in actually in the brothels do you think do you like to what is that okay i can add maybe to that please um many okay just two things i thought to add to the first question one was um actually professor thorat's work that he has done on looking at untouchability in 11 states and um, what was very interesting was the fact that it was looking at all different types of untouchability practices and and the percentage of occurrence and what was to me very interesting was that it showed that when it came to dalit women they faced a higher um, percentage of villages reported that they faced more um um discrimination on touchability practices from dominant caste women than the, then after that then it was from dominant caste men so i thought that is to me one very interesting there's been very interesting analysis of um the kerlanji massacre that happened in maharashtra a few years ago where you actively saw dominant caste women inciting men to gang rape and murder um these women and and a part of the explanation or or the trying to understand the rationale for that is the way that caste as an as an organizing structure for for identity in many way trumps ideas of of gender solidarity um and that we need to understand how that plays out um maybe another aspect i'd look at when you're looking at is to look at um not only the way that dalit men also sometimes get get used in terms of violence to to um to evade the law particularly the atrocities act because it only punishes dalit on non dalit um i mean violence by non dalits on dalits but another aspect is to look at some of the research i've done is on panchayati raj institutions a few years ago and looking at dalit women's experiences of panchayati raj because again and in a number of areas you see that there's so little research and there's so little information about for example how dalit women experience quotas because there is a separate um sc quota sc women's quota in panchayati raj institutions and what was to me very interesting because i looked at some of the research and there was very little research the only research i could find gave the traditional explanations a very gendered view that dalit women were being benam um 
proxy representatives, primarily for their men. And then when we looked at that and then we started to talk to women in Gujarat and Tamil Nadu, what we found is that for the majority of cases, you had around a third of women that struggled against incredible odds and incredible discrimination to participate in the panchats. The other two-thirds were, in our sample of 200 women, were Benamis or proxy representatives. But they were, okay, 30 seconds. They were, they were proxies primarily for dominant caste men who would often use their husbands because they are engaged in a power relationship in the villages. They are employed by dominant caste men and that way they would ensure that the husbands didn't, were the figureheads of the figureheads but who ultimately controlled the resources that were going out of the panchayat. It was the dominant castes. The time is up, but since we started late, I'm going to take two more questions and then just round it up with your final remarks. So it's two questions. That's one, two. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Just please be brief. Um, my name is Sanjukta and I work on minority rights. I'm interested in looking at how identity questions can be located in the private sphere. Um, and uh, to me, the whole domestic uh, issue, uh, the domestic sphere where Dalit women are systematically abused and uh, on the basis of how they look or what they are supposed to do, that is the domestic maid sector. And uh, the interesting thing is that they are being inst institutionalized. Uh, there are domestic maid agencies that are coming up in India now. And I wonder if there is any research that sort of systematically looks at how they are discriminated in this okay, area. Thanks. Please be brief. Uh, yeah, Kavita Kelsey, Care International UK. And um, just for the second speaker, you talked about some of the survival tactics that Dalit women might use um, after a sexual attack or other kind of attack that might be different from other women's tactics. I wondered if you could talk a bit more about that. Great. So you each have two minutes for the closing remark. Okay, who wants to go first? <laughs> those questions? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, All right, very quickly. Yep. Um, I would say in terms of the um, domestic maid question, I at least I don't know of any, I've seen sort of newspaper reports that looks at the fact that a lot of domestic um, work is done by um, Dalits and Adivasis under extremely exploitative conditions. I've not seen, I, I mean, I don't know of any research as such that has been done. Um, as to the other one, sorry, just say it again, it was looking at survival strategies. Okay. Um, in, in what ways do you think that they're different to? That case that you said. That case that you said. No? Okay. I mean, to me, I survive to say, I mean, one is to look at India's context where we have no support services for, in, in any case, for survivors of, of sexual violence. Um, but to look at in terms of in Dalit women's cases, often it is, and again this comes back, often it is a reliance on family and community um, because you know that there is little aspect of, of getting access to justice, um, which in some ways, and I, 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 it's, I'm very hesitant to generalize because I don't think you can completely say that their experiences are completely different, but in, in general, when you look at statistics, you look at women's experiences, Dalit women's experiences, they have lesser access to justice, lesser access to any kind of outside community support in order to survive and to continue. Um, and so part of the work is then of, of Dalit right activists, Dalit women's activists in terms of organizing these women, in terms of bringing forth their voices as a way to encourage sort of protection mechanisms in, in villages, um, which is it flawed because of the, the caste context in which they may live, but at least gives some hope that, okay, their, their voices will be heard, that there is a strength of collective mobilization to, to protect them. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry, I have that job to do. No, thank you for doing that. Okay. Uh, 
<clears throat> well, I'll just end by saying that there's a lot going on in my country and uh, it's not looking very good for us. And we have, as Dalit Women Collective, really stuck out our heads uh, in challenging, uh, you know, a lot of uh, issues, uh, both uh, nationally as well as internationally. We've been really challenging the domains of pay, uh, privilege that have actually uh, represented us thus far. Um, you all know that most of the South Asian Studies departments across the globe are not represented by our voices. So if we want to really have Dalit women's narratives and articulations in creating and rewriting our history and also challenging the whole um, uh, Hindu uh, dominant uh, diaspora that has actually brought in this uh, uh, government in my country. All of us have a, a role to play to really think and also what uh, he said was like what will be those uh, spaces where activists, uh, human rights campaigners, uh, researchers, scholars, students uh, and international NGOs uh, and otherwise uh, to come together and build that uh, collective strength. Otherwise then we will be uh, actually fighting a losing battle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to say that there will be a, a gender breakout session in the afternoon and these speakers will continue to be there. So if you want to pick up those points, please. Yes, you should yeah. be there. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. Could you please join me in actually thanking the speakers? Please.